Wow, Eddie, let me just stand up for you. I mean, as punctual as ever, Eddie. Well, thank you. I mean, you know, really. But and we're sticking to four o'clock. Are we really doing this? Should I but, bring Fred out here? But the problem is, like, yes? you you What's demand so much time because what? I've noticed lately you've changed. I've changed. Yeah, I've changed. All this success. Yeah, all this, it is this getting fame, to me. Yes. You know, I mean. I mean, we barely know each other. How? I don't get a fee anymore. Like wow. they're telling me that all of a sudden that your, your you financial demands are so you know are so intense they mm -hmm. can't afford it. So fee. that's why we're getting 21 minutes. Is here. that what you're getting? That's what we're getting. For hard well, we'll out do, four o'clock. We've got the Yankees tonight. Who cares about the Yankees? The pitch, Have you face heard? Face to face on the thing. This is what I'm saying about you. Yeah. Who cares about this? Is Ariel Hawani saying? Who is, cares about the Yankees? Do you look at this set? Primo. No one's giving okay. you a set we'll, like this. We'll, we'll go a few minutes over. Appreciate that. Yeah, By the way, Fred will tell me off. But... Thank you for coming. Thank I you. appreciate thank you for it. Having me. Not very happy about you guys going head to head with me with the presser on a Monday at one. Like that's kind of our yeah. territory, if oh, I'm being yeah. honest. Sorry, sorry. You know, like you... maybe we didn't have as successful a presser because of your show. How was it? Very Obviously, successful. it didn't. Work. <laughs> okay, <laughs> no, it was good. Well attended. It was yeah, very well attended. It was the second leg of uh, yeah. the, the Canelo Triple G press tour, LA on Friday. Just <laughs> it's like Canelo can't stand him, and Golovkin can't stand Canelo, but Golovkin won't actually say anything because right. he's very sort of front-facing respectful right but Canelo's saying you've said all this stuff about me say it and he's you know the head-to-heads have been very very intense yeah. and enjoyable it's gonna be a great fight I think Canelo's lost his mind in this fight like he's, he's openly saying I'm basically just gonna walk forward and knock you out and I'm gonna and which is dangerous against uh, Triple G you know people talking about you know, he's getting a bit older now he's still pound for pound probably the biggest puncher in the sport or up, right up there so and Canelo's coming off a defeat so mentally where is where's he at Can, uh, Golovkin looks great great moving up to 168 which I think will suit him he's been 160 for like 13 years so I think uh, it's gonna be a, I think it'd be the best of the three fights so far so I was curious to see which direction you would go in after the Bivol mm. fight you could obviously try to do the rematch or you could go in this direction. You ultimately went in this direction, which I think was the right call for whatever mm -hmm. it's worth. Did you consider, did you guys consider, did he consider running that one back? Yeah, we'd, we'd already signed for the Triple G fight and the aim was actually to announce the fight in the ring, which mm -hmm. obviously backfired yeah, considerably. Right. Yes. Um, you had like a promo and everything? Yeah, ready? yeah. Oh, God. Everything. I mean, but that's wow. quite common. Yeah, yeah. Like people don't realize that, but it's actually quite common. Um, and... I played golf with Canelo the next day, and he said... The next day? Yeah, the next day. Wow. Crazy. Like, he, mentally, this guy is on another level, but really upset. And playing golf while upset is never a good mix, but right. somehow he managed to do that. And he wanted the Bivol rematch. Like every fighter does. You know, It's the first thing in the mind. But obviously we had this agreement with Triple G, and this is the only chance to make this fight. The only chance. And Why? Because just time-wise, like we've waited a couple of years now... Golovkin's just unified in Japan. Like, if we leave it till next May, this was the time to strike. We had the agreement, and he wants to fight Triple G. He wants to beat him, and then he wants to rematch Bivol mm. in, in May, which is like, we keep talking about the resume of Canelo Alvarez. Like, it is incredible. And he genuinely, like, he had to almost handicap himself to lose by moving to 75, you know, against Dimitri Bivol. So... This fight's interesting, particularly coming off the loss, because his back is against the wall. Might be really bad news for Gennady Golovkin, or might be good news for Gennady Golovkin. But, you know, Canelo is uh, he's pretty open in his assessment of this fight, which is I want to retire him, and, and I will only be happy by destroying him. So, which is a nice edge. I've not seen him like this before, to be honest with you. Even when he fought Billy Joe, Billy Joe was poking him and prodding him, but he was quite calm. He wasn't really rising to the bait. Here he's, he's pretty vicious. We had Oscar Del Hoya on a couple of weeks ago. Sorry he said that. it was a massive mistake to book this fight, that you don't understand. The Bivol fight? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the thing is, promoters want to make easy fights for their clients because they want to milk as much money as possible. I am a promoter, and I do see the science in that. I'm also a fan. Like, I also want to sit there. If I'm invested in a fight, and sometimes there's quite a lot of financial risk in a fight, I really don't want to pay big money to see a mismatch. Right. I don't want to sit there and watch a mismatch. Sometimes it happens, and there's nothing that we can do about that. Not every fight is a fight of the year contender. But why do you want to criticise a guy? I mean, he's, he's, of course, out of sort of you know jealousy and the fact they fell out, and there's a lot of that. But right. why do you want to criticise a guy for trying to be great? Shouldn't we? Like you're basically saying you shouldn't have taken that fight because it was too difficult. Sort of sport 
do we live in where we're criticising fighters for taking a big challenge? Mm. Like, he's beating everyone at middleweight. He's beating everyone at super middleweight. So he, he, he wants to do something different. He wants to test himself. All of a sudden you get beat, and it's a terrible mistake. You shouldn't have done that. Should have taken an easier fight in your weight division. Boring. You know, this is a guy who's done it all. And we should respect him for trying to be great. And now comes back, fights Triple G, wants to go straight back into the Bivol rematch. If he beats Bivol in the rematch, what do we say then? Right. Greatest fighter of all time, one of. It always seems like lately, especially, I know that you've had this contentious relationship with these guys, but like I spoke to Debella recently. I don't know oh, if you saw you. that. Yeah, they all hate me. Yeah, Debella. I know the LRB stuff. Yeah. Well, why recently it feels, it, it, is this a product of your success? Is this a product of you making more noise? Why does it feel like, I'm hearing more of this hatred towards you from the other promoters. I mean, it has to be a good thing in terms of, it's a good and bad thing. I mean, it's a great thing in terms of our success. Like you wouldn't really speak out about someone you had no fear of mm. or you weren't bothered about. Yeah, and there's different kind of people. Lou DiBella is a guy who, you know, he's up and down like a lady of the night's underwear, <laughs> you know, and he's just, um, he's, he's a guy who, Literally, you do not know what mood you're going to get from Ludabella. He's, in my opinion, a guy that's quite unhappy um, and he doesn't like young, fresh blood coming in and trying to disrupt the game. Um, but at the same time, you've got guys like Oscar de la Hoya, who's obviously got that deep sort of vengeance because he lost the pound-for-pound pound biggest star in boxing and I signed him, so there's the history there. You've got Leonard Ellaby, who has lost his... Mind, and I've apparently said something that upset him. The, the, the British sarcasm doesn't sit very well with a lot of these people. Who else you got? Stephen Espinosa just sits there liking negative tweets about me all day, which is like, very, very flattering that like the head of Showtime would be that bothered about what I'm trying to do. But you see, Ariel, we had the same thing in the UK. When I started in the UK, the whole industry was against me. And we overcome that. And now I'm seeing exactly the same thing in the US. I've got to be a little bit careful because at the same time, I don't want to upset people to the point where they just won't make fights. Like the thing is with Aaron, he's like mental, but he's 90, so he deserves to be mental, <laughs> right. but he will make a fight. Like if the business is right, right, Bob will always make a fight. He'll speak badly about me. He doesn't like me, but where others will do, a, 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 you know, it will affect the job they do for their client. Mm. because of the emotion, mm. which is a really big mistake. So, but I also want to be myself. I don't, I don't want to come in here and just sort of brown those people and be a snide and like, I'm just going to speak my mind. So like me, don't like me, but, and, and the, the bad side of me, maybe the ego side in me likes that the way they are to me because it makes me even more determined, makes me work harder, makes me want to win because that's all this is. It's a sport for me, business. You know, it's about winning. It's about beating the competition. I want to make great fights. I want to be remembered. I want, I want to be a disruptor. You know, not to the level of some of these other guys coming into the sport because I respect the sport. But I want to be remembered, good or bad. I want to leave my mark in the business and in the sport. And I think what I've done, like when, when Leonard comes out and says, like, biggest clown in boxing, not being funny. I mean, I've been on the road for two and a half weeks, we're announcing our new set of shows in Australia. I've been to Jeddah, Saudi Arabia, where there's rumble in the jungle style scenes for Joshua against Usyk, probably the biggest fight in the heavyweight division. Then I've flown to San Antonio to do the Bam Rodriguez fight, new megastar in the sport. And then to do the Canelo Triple G press tour. That I mean, this is like all in 10 days work for me. So you may not like it, but you must learn to respect it. And these people, you know, it's just, it's the way I am. I, I want to, I want to, I want to make noise. Is Matchroom for sale? No, there, there's some stories going around. I mean, we have got to a point where, and, and the thing is in the UK is, it's very strange for you Americans to understand. Anybody can look at anybody's set of accounts huh. by a company's house. Wow. So you can go and look at the accounts of Matchroom and you shall see we're a huge company. I mean, people on this show might just, look at Matrim as a boxing promotion company. We do have a 10 different sports, one of right. the biggest global Darts, so. sports promoters in the world. Um, you know, there was a big story about approaches that we've had from big investment funds that yep. want to buy equity in, in Matrim. I'm not gonna comment on that for various reasons, but 
We have huge plans of global development, particularly in the sport of boxing. And as a family business, you know, this is a business that actually on Saturday we will celebrate 40 years of operation from my dad, who started under a snooker hall with him and a PA and grew this business and I've helped over the last 10 years, but you know, he's the brain, the brain child behind it, to a global powerhouse. And you're adapting all the time as a business, as a family of business, but you get to a point where you approach IPO and flotation levels and sometimes this is a route that conversations like that will take place. I have dreams and aspirations to grow the sport of boxing globally in dozens of countries around the world. And when I talk about growing it globally, I don't mean in locations where I'll just pop in and do two shows a year. I'm talking about from grassroots up. That's the passion I have for the game. So when I go to Australia or when we're in Italy or Spain, it's not just about popping in and saying, hi, Matrim are here. It's about how do we build amateur clubs? How do we grow stars in that region? And we always go back to the UFC. We are the UFC of boxing. If, even if you think we're not there yet, that's where we're going to get to because we're the only global promotional company in the world. And we're the only people with ambition to, to do that kind of thing. So those talks, you know, we're, we're, we're a sizable company that has plans to, to continue to expand internationally. And sometimes you need the expertise. It's not really about the money. We have money. But the expertise to grow that business to the IPO and to speed it up internationally at the pace that we'd like to go. Why isn't Taylor fighting Serrano next? Because Amanda Serrano didn't want the fight. What does that she, mean? She, there was no amount of money, as we were told, that would get her in that fight this time around. Particularly, probably, because the fight was slated for and what we'd like to do was in Dublin. Um, we went to Nikita, uh, Nikisa, Nikisa yep. and said, we want to do the rematch. No, we're not really interested. She's going to have another fight on Jake's card. I said, well, it's a lot of money in the rematch. Look, even if you offered, I think they gave us a number, which was well over or more than double the first fight, we still wouldn't take it. And we were like, so that's why. Disappointing, but she's, you know, I think they probably feel that if they lost again, it may be career in the balance, whereas they can go out, have a fight on the Jake Paul card and maybe look at the rematch next year. Um... Disappointing because you were there. I mean, it was just epic, wasn't it? Yeah. So we'd love to do it again. And if it's not in Ireland, maybe we do it back at the garden. So uh, obviously I asked around, I mean, this is such a big fight. We were all there. It was a huge, huge deal. What I was told was she was offered the same amount not true. for the rematch. Not true. Uh, uh, she was offered, I believe that might have been the first offer. Then we started talking about, look, what's the number? And they, they came back and said, if you offered X, which was, I think, double or very close to double, we still wouldn't be. Interested. Was Dublin the issue? Like if we'd possibly, be back in New yeah, York? Possibly. We never discussed doing it back in New York. Why not? Because we had an opportunity to do something in the sport that, which we already did, but this is on levels, 80,000 people right. at Croke Park for a female fight. I mean, and by the way, Katie Taylor won the fight. And, you know, so it's like, do you, if you believe you can win, you'd want to do the rematch. But I understand as well, she may have felt that it would have been a tougher task in Dublin, probably true. So I don't, you know, this isn't a call out to Amanda Serrano saying, can't believe you didn't take the fight, you're running from Katie Taylor. As a team, they just decided it wasn't the best move for her career. And, and maybe they're right. I was also told they take the same money at 126. Is that even a possibility? No, Katie Taylor's never boxed lower than 131 or two. She, and she's, she could never make 126 pounds. It's ridiculous. I mean, you know, Amanda Serrano is happy to fight. She's fought as high as 140. Uh, Katie Taylor is a small lightweight, but isn't going to make 130. So when she boxed at 140 for the world title, Katie Taylor, I think she weighed 138 or 39 and came in the ring at 140. So she doesn't uh, hydrate to, to big levels. I think on the, on the day, they would have been about the same weight in the ring, but... You know, that's our weight class, and um, I think we'll see the rematch one day because you get to a point where you know they'll do the fight on the Jake Paul card, and then it'll be like, I just can't earn like thirty percent of what I can earn against Katie Taylor. So let's just do the rematch, and hopefully we can get there. Is it true that there are talks to do Katie Taylor versus Chris Cyborg? Um, 
no no deep negotiations on that. I mean, look, there's two fights that I find really interesting. One is Holly Holm mm. and one is Chris Cyborg. You know, Holly Holm is a, a very good boxer. Cyborg can also box, has great power, doesn't quite have the boxing resume of Holly Holm, but they're big crossover fights. And I think Holly Holm has a fight left with the UFC, I believe, which mm. would make that difficult to do. Cyborg, I think, has a Bellator agreement but doesn't cross over into boxing. But... Just really some friendly chats. Like she was at the show at Madison Square Garden. No real negotiations, but definitely a fight that I would be interested in for a number of different reasons. Something different and fun. Like you, you get to Katie Taylor's stage in her career and you start looking at other fights and it's it's like, what can you do now kind of thing. So is it a Holly home in Vegas or a cyborg you know, in Vegas or something in Dublin. Holly in Dublin would be gigantic. Yeah, huge, you know. So I ring your friend Dana and say, let's do, do a co-pro. What's stopping fight. it from happening? Oh, you're there all the time. Yeah. You're at the I, apex. You're... I believe they've got a fight uh, planned for, for Holly home, but maybe one we reach out to Dana on. But Have you talked to her team? Holly? Yeah. No, not really. No I, conversations? I believe some, maybe some of Katie Taylor's team might have had a friendly chat, like management team, but um, and, and limited stuff with, with Cyborg. Now we know that the Serrano rematches off we'll start planning for Katie's fight and I think you'll see November December for her next fight in in Dublin I'd like to you know she's never boxed there even in that like I mean it's cold November December yeah no, no? we do it indoors November, indoors December. Yeah, is there a big enough like venue a 11 or 12 thousand yeah the yeah, three but, arena or whatever the general thought behind the team is that if and when we go to Dublin we'd like to do Croke Park right and that would be in the summer but it's not going to manifest for August or September this year. Can you say with confidence her next fight is against either Holly Holm or Chris Cyborg? Not really. No. But I can say there's a possibility. You would like that? I think it's interesting. Yeah. You know, I think she's kind of done everything in boxing and to bring in that new market to women's boxing. I mean, you're talking about... The thing I don't like about the Cyborg fight is she's big yeah. and strong. You talk about Katie making... One I don't even know if she, she can't make that. Katie would have to go up. Right. I mean, she would have to fight at one, above 140, which she can't really do. So... Right. But Cyborg has a massive problem fighting Taylor because not she doesn't mind, but in terms of the fight itself, you're fighting a pound for pound great. Katie has a problem because of the strength of Cyborg. Right. That's what makes that fight interesting. You'll probably have to see Katie go to 143 or four, and she can't she can't really do it. And then you're going to see Cyborg rehydrate to 155. She's going to be 20 pounds heavier or close to that on the night. Holly Holm is a much better technical boxer than Chris Cyborg. But I just, I just think it's something different, you know. And I think Katie's kind of earned the right to to do. It's not an exhibition. Right. It's not like we're just having a joke fight. These are dangerous females, and it just brings a new fan base to the sport. I'm going to pepper you with some questions here because no uh, the Yankees are waiting. By the way, are you throwing out the first pitch? I'm not. No. Can Who is Golovkin? Huh? At the same time? Well, I don't know how it works. I'm just. So doing why do you need to be there? I'm doing a head to head. You're doing the head to head yeah, on the pitch. You're doing head to head. Yeah. I saw you do one with uh, Chisora. It wasn't as good as me, if I'm being honest. Or a pool. Oh, that one. No, no, I'm not doing that. I'm doing an actual face-to-face. No, but I saw you yeah, do the head-to-head, head, yeah. you know. I got, I got, yeah, but. You were playing yeah, Ariel Hawani. There's, there's levels to this. Yeah. I can't, you know, I'm a good what, promoter. They couldn't get a presenter to do it? No, they've short noticed. I said I'd jump in. Cheap, obviously. Right. Didn't have to pay me. <laughs> That's true. So that worked out well. Yeah. So. All right. It, it was, I will say, not bad. You know, there's, Thanks, like mate. you said. I really, from, honestly, coming from you as a, as a head-to-head. Expert. Pioneer. I appreciate that. I, I really appreciate that. Uh, Tank Davis, any mm. talks? What's going on? No. I'm sending mean, you letters? What's I happening? I've got a letter, a legal letter to say, stop talking about Tank Davis. and stop. At all? He's he's under contract to us. Even though he said it himself? That's what I said. Right. But all I've said in my interviews is, if Tank Davis is under contract, obviously we have no interest in speaking to him. If he's not under contract, we have every interest and we'll make him a huge offer. Right. That's it. So... Um, have you talked to him? No, because it's difficult. Because, you you know, once you start reaching out to fighters, you're ultimately interfering in a contract. So right. you'd like to think that if he was available, he'll be going to people such as myself and other networks as well and asking them for an offer. But um, I like the kid. You know, very exciting. Uh, big puncher, seems to be drawing big crowds in, in different cities um, and a star of the sport. So we'll see what happens. When Devin Haney's deal with Top Rank is done, is he coming back to you? I don't know. We, we always had a dream. You know, it was, it was, I was really pleased for Devin. It was quite hard at the same time. I would imagine. You built him up. We did a lot of money into him. He had a tough decision. You know, One thing I'll say about Devin, he did everything he could to be loyal. Mm. And there are a lot of unloyal people in boxing. 
But Devin was one of those guys who basically you had you had two decisions. You stay with us and you lose the undisputed fight, everything you've always dreamed of, or you take it, you do your your time, and then maybe you can come back. We always had the dream. You know, he'd always said to me, I'm gonna be your first undisputed champion, you know, from the signing. I was like, and we believed in it. And it, it was it was disappointing not to to have that moment with yeah. him and, and, and Bill Haney. But I'm over the moon for him at the same time. Let him do the, the work. Um, and then, of course, we're, we're here. Uh, we hold no grudges because I was happy with how the process play, played out. And I was happy with the way he conducted himself. And, you know, sometimes someone will treat you a certain way. And that's that's the end. But certainly not like that with, with um, Devin and Bill. Spoke to Devin after, congratulated him. I was I was over the moon for him. Chances that if AJ wins August 20th, huge night for uh, British combat sports. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you know a guy named Leon Edwards is fighting for yeah. the UFC title. He's from Birmingham, mm-hmm. so it's a big day. Uh, that they get the that you, you you make the Fury fight. I think it's it's a given. Now he's starting to you see yeah, he's oh, starting think, to talk again. Well, he wants half a billion. Yeah, but it's, it's just not about the money. So yeah, it's right, a, so. <laughs> but but I think um, I don't I really believe AJ wins this fight, and if he does then the undisputed fight will happen. And it, it will be it will be the biggest fight of all time in boxing. Of all time. Wow. Of all time. If Usyk wins, I don't think Fury will fight him. Because we had this mix before that we were trying to get together and Fury wanted a warm-up fight before he was going to face Usyk. And you know, he talks about Usyk being a middleweight and I'll do this and I'll do He knows how good Usyk is. Like He's a very, very good fighter. Um, but Fury, you just never know. But I, I, I can't tell you how many people stopped me in the street in the UK to ask me when I, when's AJ fighting Fury. Even now, with the Usyk fight coming up, oh, we've got a rematch of Usyk. Yeah, yeah, but, but when's the Fury fight? Right, right, right. And I always actually believe that fight will happen, win, lose, or draw, August 20th. But I honestly believe AJ will, will win this fight. And if he does, you've got, you got the monster, and, and I'm sure Mr. Fury will accept the challenge. Uh, three last quick ones. Jake Paul, does he beat... Tommy Fury? I think he probably does. Like, they're, they're about the same kind of level. Like, But the problem is with Jake is you listen to him and you can't help be drawn in by the confidence. So I'm now drawn in by the confidence and putting him as a guy who deserves to be a, a boxer. And, des- you know, yet on paper, Tommy Fury should beat him easy. But then you watch Tommy Fury and you think, well, actually, you're not very good either. <laughs> so, but what is good about the fight is it's a 50-50 fight. So that's, and... and around that, the same age, around the yeah, same... Yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't, sometimes the levels of the guys, of course, you always want the elite guys fighting 50-50 fights, but as long as it's a competitive matchup, it doesn't matter. It's okay to watch. And that's a 50-50. Like, I don't actually know who's going to win that fight. I mean, if Tommy Fury loses, it is genuinely the most embarrassing thing that could ever happen to him. And, and obviously, you've got Tyson, you've got John Fury. And if Jake loses, his career's over. So therefore, it's quite it's quite exciting. High stakes. Like, yeah. At MSG. Mm. Pretty impressive. I don't know how it does. Like, I think it's a lot bigger in the UK than it is here mm. because Tommy Fury was on Love Island, yeah, like yeah, yeah. Tyson Fury's cousin. It's got, and Jake Paul's a big star in the UK. But right. I don't think, I mean, you know better than me, I'm not sure it's going to knock the socks off pay-per-view in the US but and I'm not sure how it does on the gate but you know it, I, 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 I will watch you'll order the pay-per-view I won't well I'll be in the UK so. yeah BT Sport box office yeah a lot cheaper than over here shout out to BT yeah my good friends um, Cordina Stevenson mm. what a knockout by the way oh unbelievable any chance that happens this year I mean he's got a mandatory against Rakimov we've got Zelfa Barrett in the UK we've got all these fights but of course when you win a world title like that, you want to maximise, one, your earnings, and two, your opportunity to do something great. I rate Shakur Stevenson as one of the top pound-for-pound pound fighters already. I really rate this kid. I mean, he hasn't got the profile that he deserves, but look at his resume, like who he's fought at such a young age. But... If there's one fighter right now after a performance like that that you would give the best chance to to beat Shakur Stevenson, it is Cordina. Mm-hmm. And still a, a big underdog in that fight. So, But really, once you win a world title, you want to unify and you want to become undisputed. So there's three champions. That would be a big unification. And Joe wants it. 
you know, and, and Shakur Stevenson wants it. So, Great. you know, it's a that big knockout fight. was incredible. Unbelievable. Unbelievable knockout. Uh, I'll, okay, I lied. Two more. I know okay. Fred's head is going to explode, but right. I have to ask uh, Better Biev, Bivol. Mm. Any chance? I, I should probably ask yeah. this to Frank Smith because I know he's, uh, yeah, but, he's Bivol's yeah, he's, uh, he's promoter. Bivol. The, the problem is sometimes, like, there's a lot of smoke and mirrors in boxing. Right now, Dimitri Bivol does not have a fight scheduled. Okay. There is no excuse why Better Biev Bivol doesn't happen. Now, yes. it's about October, November, wherever. You know, Bob came straight out and said, oh, we're not doing it on dark zone. He's trying to take the mic out of the zone. I was like, we don't have to do it on, on the zone. So we can do it on ESPN if you want. But we, we don't have a fight scheduled. They've got a mandatory that they've made up against Anthony Yard, which, of course, could be delayed, like, for an undisputed fight. Right. But I'm not saying Better Beab doesn't want to fight Bivol, but that fight's there. We've not received any offers for that fight. We'd be willing to entertain and, and talk about that fight. One of the best fights in boxing. Yes. So if better, and the problem is, is that I believe if Canelo beats Triple G, he'll rematch Bivol in May. So really you're, you're delaying the undisputed fight because if we don't do that fight now, you're not going to be able to do it till the end of next year, which is a shame because right. it's a great fight. So I, I see, you know, if they don't want to make that fight, then really what we should do in that kind of situation is me and Bob go into a room with a couple of envelopes and we do like a private bid uh, on that fight. You know, we, we stream it on, on the MMA Hour. That would be great. Obviously. I was going to say DAZN, but fine, no, no, go you, ahead. You, you know, you're, thank you've you. got the big platform. Yeah, I appreciate there. that. Thank you. And we just have a bit of fun with it. Yeah. But it's, it, the problem is now, it's like, the first thing he does is get on the front foot and say, we're not doing it on DAZN. It's like, all right. Yeah, chill out. Calm down. Like, yeah. why, well, what about your fighter? Like, do you want to be undisputed? And, and why shouldn't we be able to be competitive in that market? And, and we might pay your fighter more money than you want to pay him. No, but I'm not doing it on this. It's like, it's always like protecting yourself rather right. than thinking about the fighter. So we'd love to put, you know, I, I believe that you know, what we're doing at the moment is we're going to a lot of international territories with that are producing government funding to stage historic and major boxing events. We're doing it all the time around the world. And that's another fight that would tick boxes in that respect. But if we don't do it now, you're going to see Canelo probably rematch Bivo if he wins against Triple G in May. So, you know, we're ready, ready to make it's that It's very fight. Vince McMahon-esque what you're doing. I don't know if you know the history of WWE or WWF when he went to all these different territories and everyone got mad at him for doing it because mm. it was a certain way that you had to book events and you had to stick to the Northeast. Yeah. And he said, screw that, I'm going to St. Louis, I'm going here. Mm. What you're doing is very reminiscent. And everyone was mad at him. He didn't care. He, 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 he pretty much bought them all out and then hired them to work for him. I don't know if you'll hire these I dudes to work I, for you. I think... Well, I went to Australia recently mm -hmm. and no one likes me being it. Like, and I wouldn't. Like if I was a promoter in Australia and I came in or someone like me and start, you know, but in those territories, it's not a case of just we're controlling things. We can work alongside other promoters. Australia is never going to be our number one territory. But because of the brand that we're building and the credibility that we're building among fight fans, we can go to these international cities with the credibility in place, like the UFC do. And you don't always become talent dependent. Right. You need to build talent in that region. But the great job that the UFC have done is built the profile and the credibility of the business and the loyalty of the customer to be able to go to different territories and say, the UFC are here. You buy a ticket, sometimes without knowing who's on the card. Yeah, yeah. And, and of course, you want to build great cards, but that's the credibility now that we're getting globally, particularly through the global platform of the zone. And, and it's just the beginning. Like, there's, there's multiple territories to conquer. Vince McMahon style, don't know how I feel about being, you know. But, well, I mean, but also, a promo, promotional legend. Yeah. yeah. You know, and, and I look at these business, businesses, you know, um, Vince McMahon, UFC. We want to sit alongside them. And, you know, we run all our production now. A lot of what we do is very similar. Right. And these are very successful businesses that, of course, we, we aspire to sit alongside. Last one, if Crawford Spence happens, will you be involved? No. No, great fight. You're out I mean, of I'll the... Get, I got criticised recently because I said Canelo Triple G is much bigger. Mm. My argument of bigger is dollars, right? And, and Canelo Triple G generates four or five times more than that fight generates. And the reason that fight's not getting made at the moment or hasn't been yet is because the fighter's beliefs of, of the money involved is not the reality of the situation. Now, those guys see AJ, Canelo, Fury making 30, 40, 50 million... They want that for that fight. Right. It's not there. It's a massive fight in boxing, one of the best fights in boxing. Walk out on that street now on Wall Street and say, 
are you interested in Spence Crawford? No one would even know who, what you're talking about. But it's a brilliant fight that we should all push to make. Just as a promoter, I know the numbers. And it, it's just, someone's going to have to take a massive punt or you're going to have to get a site fee from, from one of these territories right, right. to deliver the money that those fighters want for what is an extremely risky fight for both. Pleasure as always. Thank you for doing this. You're going to go to Yankee Stadium, by the way, and everyone's going to say, why did you cut it short? This is a way bigger platform than Yankee Stadium. Well, you should you have know. stayed longer. We had a lot more things to discuss, but I do I've appreciate... have spread the love. Sometimes, you know, little appearances and Yankee. little teams like the Yankees yeah. have to play. Fred told me, though, you said you're not leaving New York without coming here, and so I appreciate oh, that. Always, every time very kind. We're in. I think it's four times in 2022, go, making history. Thank you, sir. Cheers, mate. Good luck to you. Thank Appreciate you. it. Safe travels, wherever you're off to next.